And welcome back to America's Forum right here on Newsmax TV. I'm John Bachman. And I'm J.D. Hayworth. Interesting guest coming up right now, John. Phyllis Chesler, Emerita Professor of Psychology and Women's Studies at City University of New York. She's a best-selling author, a legendary feminist leader, and a psychotherapist in addition to being an expert yes. uh, courtroom yes. witness. Dr. Chesler has published thousands of articles, and most recently, she's conducted studies about honor-related violence, including honor killings. Uh, her books, Women in Madness and Woman's Inhumanity to Woman, have been widely translated. And her 15th and most recent book, An American Bride in Kabul, won the 2013 National Jewish Book Award in the category of memoir. And now she joins us from Newsmax TV, New York. Dr. Chesler, we thank you very much for making time for us here today on America's Forum. It's my pleasure to be with you. Dr. Chesler, your new book, An American Bride in Kabul, tells of your experience there with your Afghan husband, uh, how you arrived in 1961, your passport taken away, and you were forced to live life according to your husband's family rules. Uh, tell us about that. Did, did you think of yourself as a hostage in that situation? Absolutely. When I met him, he was very westernized. We met in America at college. We never discussed Islam. We never discussed Afghanistan. I thought we were going for a visit. And once I was there, as you pointed out, pro forma, they took my passport away. And I was suddenly the citizen of no country and the property of a very large, polygamous, powerful Afghan family. And I could not go out alone. I was in Purda, in a very modern, spacious villa, mansion, if you will, many servants. But I was in Purda with the other women. And uh, this is not what I had expected. I, I lived gender apartheid. I saw women in bed sheets, burkas, sensory deprivation, isolation chambers, long before Rosa Parks decided not to sit at the back of the bus. I saw the women in burkas at the back of the bus in Afghanistan, and I have never forgotten this. When you think back to those days, uh, Phyllis, is there one memory that stands out with, with uh, I guess, uh, a, a poignancy or, for lack of a better term, Phyllis, a real terror? Do you ever have nightmares about the experience to this day that, that stay with you? No, but what I do see is Afghanistan has followed me into the West and into the future. There are burkas on the streets all over America, and bin Laden was given shelter in the very place where I was held hostage, and now his brand of jihad is holding the entire civilian world hostage. And I think of how ill I got there, and that I could have died very easily, nearly did die, and I think now of the plight of the innocent women and children in places like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Syria, endless number of countries which are on fire and I think I could have been there and they could be me. Well, Professor Chester, tell us about your journey and how you were able to get out of Afghanistan and get back to living uh, you know, a more regular life. Well, I usually say you should read the book to see exactly how I got out, but I did get out with an Afghan passport, which I still have on a six-month visa, and then the American State Department said I had to leave, and I said, no, no, I'm going to chain myself to the Statue of Liberty, and it took three years and many lawyers for me to get an annulment and my American passport, a new one, and I went to graduate school, and I became a psychologist, and I was involved in the civil rights movement. I had seen people that were living in poverty that Americans could not comprehend, corruption, uh, cruelty. I saw my mother-in-law beat her female servants. The servants were treated like slaves. I'd never seen anything like this. And I never forgot it, and so it inspired me in America. And then, of course, I became a feminist leader. I never forgot the, the plight of women around the world. And I think uh, what sets me apart from many other feminists today is I'm not a multicultural relativist. 
I have one standard, and it's universal for human rights. And I work with Muslim and ex-Muslim dissidents and feminists who share the desire for individual rights, gay rights, human rights, a separation of religion and state, and who view the Western enterprise as their greatest hope. Well, as, as you're discussing this, Phyllis, and we think about the modern feminist movement, your, your response right there seems to indicate that there is a rift, that there are those who look uh, in, in terms of multiculturalism, that all regimes have value. Have you been met with, with a great deal of opposition? Because it would seem your personal experience is so profound that it would stop the would-be mul multiculturalists in their tracks. Oh, you are such a dreamer. I have been met with enormous hostility mm. and shunning and also secret admiration and support, not so public. So feminists are afraid to be called Islamophobes or racists. And that concern trumps any concern with sexism, unfortunately. So you'll have good card-carrying feminists in America saying things like, who are we to judge another culture? All cultures are equal. We are mighty sinners. And they have no understanding of the history of imperialism, colonialism, anti-black racism, conversion by the sword that is Islam's history. They don't have a clue. So they say, well, you know, the veil, it's sexy, it's a choice, it's a personal or religious choice. Who am I to judge? And I say girls and women are being murdered if they refuse to wear the face veil. How can we support it? Well, Professor, gender apartheid, you talked about your experience. Talk to us about what it's like today uh, and if it's still actively going on and, and who's working inside Afghanistan to fight it. Well, you know, to their credit, many Americans, both feminists and not, have been sending money and staffing shelters for women, setting up schools for girls, getting supplies for hospitals, enormous international support, goodwill. The moment the boots on the ground leave that country, as they must, I fear, the country will be plunged back into the seventh century. Yeah, big changes ahead, and it's, and it's scary to think about what might happen once U.S. forces leave uh, this year. Dr. Thanks Phyllis Chesler, thank you very much for your time, and we look forward to uh, reading your book, and it was good to hear her point of view. There is more to come. Your turn, specifically, your comments. Tonight, we are a country awakened to danger. Tear down this wall.